Today we're going to be learning Rosh Hashanah Daf Kavav. Uh, today's Daf is sponsored by Becky Goldstein to celebrate her granddaughter Sarai's eighth birthday and the anniversary of her parents Kobe and Rotem. Born at week 25 at 890 grams, Parshat Chaye Sarah, Rabbanim suggested to name her Sarai, a stronger name than Sarah. So began weeks of tefillot across the globe for Rufuash Lema while Sarai tested our Amuna and won our hearts. I know that her guardian angel has always been Sarah Imenu, Mazal Tov. And this week's learning is sponsored by Terry Kravosha for Rufuash Lema for Elisheba Bat Ora. Okay, we, before we start, just a mention about our Siyum. Our Siyum is coming up um, November 14th on Sunday. We're going to celebrate the Siyum of Masechet uh, Rosh Hashanah and use it as a springboard to Masechet Ta'anit. Ta'anit is a very short, easy Masechet, and, uh, and Nechmad, it has a lot of stories. It's all about rain, and uh, it's very, very interesting. So I recommend if you know people who are interested in starting to learn, maybe it's a great, really good, easy way to get into Daf Yomi. So we love for you to spread the word and share with your friends um, the excitement about learning and maybe convince people to get started right now. So our seum is going to actually combine. Both have an element of Rosh Hashanah and an intro to Ta'anit so that people who haven't come can also join the seum and start to get an inside look into what Ta'anit will be all about. And um, in Israel, we're going to have seums around the country, so that the, the details for that should go out sometime today. We are going to start now at the bottom of Cafe Amubet. Where were we? We were talking about two, three witnesses who are all Dayanim. They see the new moon. So two of them become witnesses. One becomes the judge, but can't judge by himself. So he has to bring two more people. Now, what do you notice here? That he himself saw the testimony and yet he can function as a judge. This is not such a clear-cut issue, and that's what the Gemara says. Are you to say that an aide can become a Dayan? That if you're a witness to some event, you're, you can be the judge of that? Seems a little bit strange. And in fact, it sounds like that our Mishnah doesn't match the opinion of Rabbi Akiva, because we're going to see that Rabbi Akiva disagrees with Rabbi Tarfon and thinks that ain't aid not said Dayan. You can't be a, a witness if you saw, witness something. You can't be a judge in that case. So we'll, let's read inside, and then we'll see why. Detanya, as it says in the following Brita, Sanhedrin shera'u achad sharagat nefesh. If the whole Sanhedrin saw someone commit a murder, Miktzatan asu edin. Miktzatan asu dayanim devay Rabbi Tarfon. Rabbi Tarfon says, no problem. What do we do? Part of the Sanhedrin becomes the witnesses. The rest of them function as judges. It's fine. Rabbi Akiva omel, kulan nasu edin. edin. Rabbi Akiva says, no. They all become witnesses, and they can't become a judge. Once you're a witness, you can't be a judge in the same case. So we don't yet know the reason, but we'll see the reason in one more minute, so I'll, I'll wait to get there. So the Gemara seems to say, it sounds like our mission doesn't match Rabbi Akiva, to which the Gemara says, Afilu tema Rabbi Akiva. No, Afilu tema Rabbi Akiva means I could still read the Mishnah like Rabbi Akiva. How so? Ad kan lo kama Rabbi Akiva hatam ele bedine nefashat. Rabbi Akiva was only talking about in Dine Nefashot, meaning in a, in a life and death case. What happens in Dine Nefashot? If we, if we in the end say that the murderer is guilty, he gets killed according to Jewish law. We don't want to kill someone unnecessarily. Therefore, we take it very, very seriously. And it says, Bidine Nefashot in the Pasuk. The Torah says, They judge the person and they save the person, meaning they have to attempt to save him. So now, If you yourself witness the murder, would you it would be very, very difficult for you to try to find a way to get the guy off the hook. And since the whole goal of a, of a court ruling on a person being a murderer, not the whole goal, but a main part of the goal is, they should always try to make sure that maybe this person isn't guilty. Now, if you're the one who saw the murder, it's going to be very hard for you to be partial. So, not to be partial, sorry. Um, but here, maybe even Rabbi Akiva would agree that when it comes to Kiddush HaChodesh, yet again, we see Kiddush HaChodesh doesn't fall into the same category as other testimonies. Although, here there's a minor difference. Here, the cutoff is not the difference between Kiddush HaChodesh and, let's say, Dine Mamanot. The cutoff is all other cases versus Dine Nefashot. Dine Nefashot has its own 
unique laws, whereas everything else maybe would be different. Where we draw the line in Eina Sedayan and all this, can we, can't we, what are the different opinions about it? There's a lot, a lot to be said here, much more of an Iyun Kaipatayin Sugyon. This is one of these major Sugyon in Masechet Sanhedrin, um, which makes sense because that's all about the courts. So Gethet this week gives a little bit of insight into at least Machlok at Rashi Tosfot. It should be up later today. So I recommend listening to get an idea about some of the, the inner workings of this machloket and some of the, right, there's a lot you could start to distinguish in a lot of ways between Edna and Dayan in different types of cases. Is there a difference to Rabban and to Oraita, for example, right? Then we're going to see that you'll see there that Tosfot makes a distinction. So you get a little bit of Iyun if you want to, you know, more in-depth learning if you want to listen to Gephet this week. Okay, um, starting with the new Mishnah. Now, I want to just make a point before we go on. If you remember in the, the last Perak, and when chapter two started, I mentioned that some people said that the cutoff of the chapters was wrong and that the first Mishnah should have been in the last chapter. Here also, it seems, I didn't look and see if people say it, but it does seem that this first Mishnah is very, should have belonged to the last chapter. And now we're starting to talk about Shofar, which is going to take us for a while now. So it's interesting that you know, we finish up with the with the court and then move into shofar. You would have thought they would have started the chapter here with shofar, and because this Ra'u Beitim was really a continuation of the previous, so it's a little bit strange. We're going to have a machloket in the Mishnah, which is usually pretty basic in the Mishnah. We have a machloket. We're going to have Tanakama Rabbi Yossi. But what kind of animal can you use a shofar? What, from which animal is a shofar kshera? And what's also interesting about this Mishnah is it's going to give a reason. Not always do we get reasons of why he holds this way, he holds that way, but the Mishnah here actually gives reasons, which is going to be interesting in light of what you'll see the Gemara does. So I want to specifically point that out right now. So any shofar can be used. Kshirim usually means this is kasher, something else is pasu, no good. Chutz Michel para. You can't use the shofar from a para, a, a cow. Mipnei shehu keren. Because it's a keren, okay? That's called keren, it's not called shofar. Amar Rabbi Yossi. Okay, well you can see, maybe this is an allusion to what we're going to get to later. There's going to be a lot of talk of linguistics today, okay? Of language and what word is used, etc. Amar Rabbi Yossi. Falo kol shofarot nikru keren. What do you mean? All shofarot from other animals also are called keren. How do I know this? Shene'emar bimshoch bekeren hayovel. And we're going to see later the yovel is an ayel, is a ram. When you below in the keren of the yovel, of the ram. And if it wasn't that you knew that a ram's horn is called a shofar, the rest of that pasuk were actually in Yoshua when they do around Yericho and they blew the shofar seven times and they, you know, every day they walked around blowing the shofar. So it says, right, and sorry, every day they circled and on the last day, it said, right, and when, the, when you, we, blow when you hear the meshech of the keren of the yovel, when you hear the kol shofar, which is basically saying the same thing twice, which means that the keren is the shofar. Okay, so there you have it. So now the Gemara is going to say, okay, so remember, just to be clear, Tanakama says, para, its horn is called a keren and not a shofar, and therefore it's no good. Rabbi Yossi says, what are you talking about? All karnai, we don't just call them shofar, we call them keren. So, and here's a proof from a Pasuk in Yoshua. So the Gemara says, starts off with saying, Shapir Ka'ama Rabbi Yossi, he has a good point. So what are the rabbis going to respond to that? Ve'rabanan, what will they say? Kol shofarot ikru shofar ve'ikru keren. What he meant to say is, all shofarot are called either keren or shofar. But, de para ikre keren shofar lo ikre. But a para is only called keren. You would never call the horn of a para a shofar. Dichtiv, how do we know this? It says, bechol shoro hadar lo, em karnav. Okay, it's talking about a shore, which is in the family of the para, right? The bull and the, and the cow. Vikarnei em karnav. His karnaim are karnav. In other words, they're saying, keren is what we call them. We don't call them anything else. So what's Rabbi Yossi going to say to that? I'll prove you that a para can also be called a shofar. Where? Dichtiv, here's a passage from Tehilim. V'titav Hashem mishor par. The pshat here is that we're saying, your tefillot, your prayers are better to me than a shor or a par. Okay, but it says it a little bit strange. A shor or a par meaning, from your sacrifices, I'd rather have your tefillot, 
your prayers and my sacrifices. So, or at least that's some way that people explain this verse. So now, it should say shore or par, or it should say me shore or me par. Why does it need both of them? So they say, im shore lama par, im par lama shore. The question the Gemara asks is, which one? In other words, you really only need one. Why does it say both? El amai mi shor par, mi shofar. He says, oh, it's a reference to shor par, right? If you put them together, you get shofar. Okay, you have to drop the resh, but okay. You get shofar, it sounds like shofar. And from here we get, and it's talking about a shor and a pal, which are in the cow family. Ah, there you have shofar having to do with a, with a para. So then Rabbanan, what are they going to say to this? They understand the pasuk differently. Kedir Rav Matna, the way Rav Matna understood it, to Amar Rav Matna, my shor pal, shuhu gadol kipal. If you remember, we had how old they are. A par is a three-year-old, whereas a shor could be any age. So it's saying even from a shore that's three years old, in other words, the bigger, right, the older they are, the bigger the sacrifice, my, your tefillot are better to me than even a shore that's as big as a par. And that's why it said shore par. Okay, that's, so we had, again, each one, I want to get the structure clear. Each one brought a pasuk to prove their point. According to Rabbi uh, Tanakama, you can't use a para. According to Rabbi Yossi, you can even use a para. And then we got to what does each one do with the other one's claim, right? And really, Rabbi Yossi seemed to have a good claim, but we brought Rabbanan's interpretation, how they would say. Now comes something a little bit strange. Remember, I said from the beginning that the reason for their opinion is already in the Mishnah. So you would think that you wouldn't need any more reason than that. They already tell their reason. But Ula and Abaye are both going to bring a different reason for the rabbis about why they said a para is no good. Okay? It's unclear why they do this when in the Mishnah we already know their reason. And the Gemara at the end is going to ask on each of them, why, why didn't it say this in the Mishnah? In other words, like, why are you giving us a reason if it already says so in the Mishnah? And basically they're all going to say we're adding another additional reason. Words, we think this reason is very compelling and therefore we're going to add it as well. Okay, maybe they think that there's more to Rabbanan than what they said. Okay, or they're just coming up with their own interpretations. So, Ulama, Hainu Tama de Rabbanan, Kid Rav Chista. As Rav Chista says to Amar Rav Chista, Mipne ma en Kohen Gadol, you might remember this from Yoma, Nichnas bibigde zahav lefanai velefnim la avod avodah. Why doesn't the Kohen Gadol and Yoma Kippurim go in with the golden clothes? Remember, the Kohen Gadol normally wears gold clothes. On Yom Kippur, he wears white clothing and he switches. Remember all the switches? He goes to the Michvi, does Kiddush Adayim Veraglayim, right? Each time he switches his clothes, every time he goes inside, he wears white clothes. Why not gold? Do you remember this? Lefisha ein kategor na sesanigor. The prosecutor can't become the advocate. He's our advocate right now. We don't want to bring something that would remind God of our sins. That's the worst time to remind God of our sins. He goes in there to get atonement. And we're going to bring gold clothes. What are gold clothes reminiscent of? The golden calf, the cheta egel. So we don't want to remind God of one of our biggest sins in history. So we can't go in with golden clothing. So therefore, right, we're not going to use a shofar that comes from a para because a para, an egel, the egel azaha, was a calf, which is a calf of a para. It's going to remind God of cheta egel. So don't use the shofar specifically when you're asking for Right? It's, it's almost, and here we're going to see even later, they're comparing the moment of Tkiyat Shofar to the moment of Yom Kippur, of going into the Kodesh Kodeshim, which is interesting, right? Because remember when we learned that and it was such a powerful emotional moment and Shofar is supposed to have that same effect. And we're going to see in the Sigya that they clearly seem to be Ula, I think, wants you to envision that moment of Shofar blowing as that moment of the Kodesh Kodeshim, right? And if you feel like nowadays we never really have that moment of Kodesh Kodeshim, we do have this ceremony where we go through the avoda, but if you want anything as close to that, maybe it's shofar, and that that's the moment that it's supposed to feel that way. So he says, so now the Gemara is going to have a slew of questions on Ula. Number one, velo, what do you mean? You can't use a para inside the Kodesh Kodeshim? Va'ikadam pal. We bring the blood of a bull, ho, right? Into the Kodesh Kodeshim? So wouldn't that remind God of Cheda Ega? You see, no, the blood of the bull doesn't really remind God of the, of, of the, the egel. It looks very different. It doesn't look like you're bringing in an animal. You're just bringing in its blood. It could look like any other blood. It's not the same as kind of gold clothes in God's face or a shofar coming straight from the para, right? Which hasn't changed forms at all, right? It's not, it's not like the blood. Wait, you said no gold, but aren't there golden 
um, vessels inside the Kodesh Kodeshim, there's the Aron, there's the Kaporet, there's the Kruvim. They're all made of gold. So what do you mean? We're in the Kodesh Kodeshim, there's gold right there. So they say, What I meant was, a sinner can't bring in gold with him. In other words, the Kohen Gadol is representing the sins of the people. He can't walk in and bring inside. Yakriv here doesn't mean Yakriv is in sacrifice. Yakriv means to go closer. He can't go in and to bring. He can't bring closer to God this gold and put it in God's face. But something that's set there and doesn't move, that's totally fine. But wait, you want to say, okay, you can't bring it in. But what about the kaf and the machta? Remember the Kohen Gadol goes in, he's carrying with his two hands, one the, the, the ladle and one the pan with all the hot coals in it and one the incense. Those are made of gold so how, and he's bringing them into the Kodesh Kodeshim. So why do you do that? So they say, Okay, I'll change it a little. What I meant was you can't adorn yourself in them. The Kohen's not adorning himself when he carries these in. They're not on his body. They're not to make him look beautiful. They're, he's just bringing them in because he has to bring them in. So, okay, we got that. Okay, but if you want to say that the Kohen can't beautify himself with them, but he wears golden clothes outside on that day. And he's basically the whole day he's asking for forgiveness. So they say, Ah, no, I meant inside the Kodesh Kodeshim. That's exactly why, right? When you go inside the Kodesh Kodeshim, you can't go with gold because that will remind God of Chera Ego. But when you're outside, that's fine. Oh, well, that's going to raise a very big question. As in Shofar Nami Bibachutu, when they blew the shofar in the temple, they didn't blow it in the Kodesh Kodeshim. They blew it outside the Kodesh Kodeshim. So then it shouldn't be a problem. In Katigor Nasas Senegor is for Kodesh Kodeshim. And here's where I think the Gemara is comparing the moments. Say, Kevan, a very powerful line. Kevan de lezikaronhu ke bifnim dami. Because what are you trying to do in that moment? You're trying to have God remember us litovah. It's the same idea as going into the Kodesh Kodesh of Yom Kippur. You're trying to get atonement for the people and have a better future. That moment is as if you're inside. You're not inside, but it's, it's got that power as if you're inside. I think this is a very powerful line. Talking about the strength of the moment of blowing the shofar. That even though you're not in the Kodesh Kodeshim, it's as if you're in the Kodesh Kodeshim. Okay, so that's a big that's a big line, and that's the end of really Ula, right? So now the last final question we have to ask at Ula. So we finally narrowed it down. It's only things you bring into the Kodesh Kodeshim or at that moment of blowing the shofar where you're reminding God. And that's why all these other things don't apply. So now the Gemara says, kama. But the Tana already said his reason. So why are you saying his reason is in Kategor Senegal when it clearly says in the Mishnah, the reason is because it's not because it's called Karen. To which they answer, kamar. Okay? Um, wait, did I miss that? Right, Chadav Kamar. It's saying that and another thing. One, it's because the prosecutor shouldn't become the advocate. Number two, and in addition, because we we call it Karen and we don't call it Shofar. So he has two reasons. For Rabbi Yossi, now we have to explain. According to Ula, what's Rabbi Yossi's retort? It's a pretty good, it's a pretty good uh, answer. in So Rabbi Yossi, Amar Lecha, he would say, he clearly doesn't look at shofar as the same moment as going inside. So that's something different. Going inside Kodesh Kodeshim, you can't do that. Here, we're outside. It's not as serious. Not as powerful a moment, and therefore, maybe powerful in a different way. Therefore, it's not a problem to bring the par. Marta, And now, and this we already know the answer, but if we already said that Ul is saying, then we're saying, um, if you're saying that we call a shofar a keren, which is a horn, okay, we call the, the horn of the para a horn. Okay, that's the, I saw the question, what is a keren? A keren is a horn. So we call it a horn. Also, right, he says, all shofarot are called horns, and therefore the fact that we call the para, we call his keren, and by the word, his horn, by the word, Karen doesn't bother us, all the others also, and therefore, right, and we already said it could also be called Shofar from the shore par. That was Ula. So again, Ula brought a second reason. Abai is going to do the same thing. Abai Amal, Hainu Tamad Rabbanan, 
שופר אחד אמר רחמנא ולא שניים ושלושה שופרות. The Torah says שופר, not two or three שופרות, okay? The intent is one שופר. So now they say, why, so what's the issue? והא דפרה כיוון דקאי גילדה גילדה מתחזה כשניים שלושה שופרות. Okay, for this we need the picture. The picture shows, I don't know if you can see this well, but in picture 39 it shows here that the way, there's actually a mistake here, a typo in these pictures, it says Shana Aleph, Shana Gimel, Shana Gimel, it should be Shana Aleph, Shana Bet, Shana Gimel. Each year it grows a new layer almost, okay? So you can see these lines between the layers and you can see the difference in the way the shofar looks by the years. So because each year there's an added section that, and it's noticeable, therefore it doesn't look like one whole shofar, it looks like a bunch of shofarot. And that's why he thinks that you can't use a carrion of a para. Because that's not true for other animals. So now they say, uh, sorry, uh, In Abayi, we don't have that whole slew of questions we had on Ula, but we do have that same basic question, which is, but the rabbis already said what their reason is in the Mishnah. So again, what he wants to say is there's an added reason here. One is, The Torah said one, not two or three. You'd have to say, by the way, it's not the Torah, it's Tiku B'chodesh Shofar B'kesel Yom Chagenu. It's the Pesach and Tehillim, right? Because remember, the Torah never says Shofar. Ve'od, and additionally, M'pnei Shuhu Kechen. Ve'Rabi Yossi Amar Lecha, Deka Amar, so again, what's Rabbi Yossi going to say? When you said Shofar Achan Amar Achman Avalo Shnayim Ushlosha Shofarot, first I'll answer that claim. Again, it's not Rabbi Yossi talking, it's the Gemara speaking in place of Rabbi Yossi. He would say, it's still one unit. It doesn't, it might be a little bit noticeable, but it doesn't look like two or three shofarot, right? You saw that picture. It doesn't really look like it's separate shofarot. And this we already know, and you said, because it's a Karen, all shofarot are called Karen, therefore that's not a question. Okay, now we're going to go back, and I told you we're going to get into etymologies of words, or really the meaning of words, right? When you want to look up a word, what do you do nowadays? You go into Google, and you search it in Google, and you find the definition, right? When I was growing up, it used to be a dictionary, right? You'd open up a dictionary. I mean, once in a while, we open up a dictionary in our house, but it's pretty rare at this point. But you would open up a dictionary. If you were the rabbis in the time of the Gemara, you didn't have dictionaries to open, and you didn't have, right, yeah, thanks, you didn't have Jastro, which is, right, the best Aramaic dictionary, um, you didn't have that option. So what would you do? So we're going to see what they did in various situations to find out definitions of words. And this comes up, sugyot like this, in many, many places in the Gemara. And this is a particularly long one. So first it starts off with our mission. We're going to see how we got there. I mean, I already mentioned that this whole idea of Karen and whether we call it Karen or Shofar is also a linguistic issue. But now they're going to go off on this. My mashma dahai yovla lishna dedichrohu. How do we know that a yovel, in the pasuk we quoted, b'mshoch keren ha-yovel, that it was an ayel, a ram. Okay, dichra is zachal, it means a male animal, which is the male ram. So how do we know it was a ram? Ditanya. So we're going to see a brighter that explains it. Amar Rabbi Akiva, kesha'alachti la'aravya, hayu korin ledichra yovla. When I got to Arabia, I figured out that I saw that they were calling a ram, yovla. And that's how I knew what it was. So here you learn that the way they knew things was from foreigners, other people in different countries. They learn from what they said. It would help understand what we, what language we use, right? Because we obviously were connected with them at some point. We had similar languages, right? This is all the Semitic languages are similar. And I'm laughing because my kids are learning for the psychometry right now. And it's the funniest thing. I, if you learn Gemara, you can do well on the language part of the psychometry because so many of the words come from the Gemara and they're Aramaic and it's, it's fascinating. Keep telling them you should have learned more Gemara and then you'd be able to do well on the psychometry. But anyway, that's how, right? So they, they kind of were, and, and I wonder sometimes why, but it's because our language is based on, right? It comes from the same roots, Aramaic and Hebrew, and therefore a lot of these words come from the Aramaic. So I'm Rabbi Akiva. Now we're going to have a whole slew of other words that they didn't know, seemingly totally disconnected. Okay, one could try to make a theory, maybe to try to connect all these things. I'll come up with a theory at the end about kind of putting it all together, maybe some idea that's coming out of this of this Gemara, but that, of course, is just conjecture. You can come up with your own thoughts. Amar Rabbi Akiva, Shalachti the Galia, when I went to this place called Galia, Hayu koreim lenida galmuda, they called the nida galmuda, my galmuda, I tried to figure out what is the meaning of it. 
Gmula da mi ba'ala. She's separated from her husband. Gmula da galmuda. Da is, is, you know, this or she. Okay, so she's separated from her husband. That's why she's called galmuda. Ba'amar Rabbi Akiva. Kshalachti la'afriki. When I went to Africa, it seems Rabbi Akiva traveled around. Most people think this is actually Africa nowadays. Hayu korin lema'a kesita. Ma'a is it as a currency, a coin. They used not a currency, a coin. They called that coin the ma'a a kasita. The ma'inaf kamina. What's the relevance of this? Well, liferushe mea kasita deoraita mea danke. The mea kasita mentioned in the Torah, which is the amount of money that Yaakov bought land from Hamor, the father of Shechem, was a hundred kasita. Now you know the kasita is a hundred danke, which is a hundred mea. Okay, that's how you know. Amarabi, Rebbe. Shalachti lekarchea yam. Another place where they always found out about languages, this comes up in a lot of studio, is by the places on the water, because they were port cities, people came from all different places. Hayu korin lemechira kira. They would call a sail kira. Now, lemayin afkamina, what's this relevant for? Leperushe asher kariti li. Okay, this is what Yosef says at the end of Sefer Breshit. Avish bi'ani lemor, my father made me swear, he says to Paro, I want to go back to bury my father in, in Eretz Canaan. Okay, I want to die in the in the grave. That now karitili usually means that I dug, okay, which would make sense in the context here, right? Lichrot bores to dig a, a pit. So it sounds like in the grave that I dug. But now when he heard this language, he said, "Ah, oh, karitili means that I purchased. I want to go to the place, right, the, the where he purchased it, and then it means something very different than what we thought it meant." Another place. That's something we know, the Tarnagol is Sechvi. From our davani every day. It's in Berchot HaShachar. That they, God gave, right, knowledge to the rooster. Some people say it's a rooster. Some people say it's man or a woman, you know, humans. Either to humans or to the rooster. There's a big debate about it. We saw it in Brachot. Now, what the sechvi is here, obviously, they're going by the opinion that a tarnagol, it's a rooster. Now, we're going to try to find some, like, he sees this, he hears this from other people, but then he realizes, I can find root for this in the Torah. Where does this come from? Okay, which is the beauty of Jerusalem. Sounds like nof ninfi. Okay, nymphy comes from there. I would not recommend calling a kala that you see a nymphy. I don't think she would like it. It doesn't sound very nice. But in those days, apparently, it was a compliment. And letarnagol sechvi amar of Yudam Arav, Ibaitem Arav Yeshob and Levi. One of them said it. My kla, what's the pasuk? Mishat, the pasuk from Eov. Mishat betuchot chokmah, who has put wisdom in inner places? Uletarnagol sechvi. And who put the, the, the intelligence in the rooster? Amar of Yehuda. Um, uh, sorry. Um, those are our kidneys, full of wisdom. Right? I think it's talking about the wonders of our body and how our body eliminates waste, right? It's an amazing thing. My, my mother in law, Shalom, always talked about the wonders, how when she, after di- being on dialysis, she said it's unbelievable, you know, when you say Asher Yatzal and you think about the wonders of something that we take as so basic. Um, Okay, that's the Tarnagol, who Natan Sachvivina, again, intel- understanding, to understand the difference between night and day, or at least that's how we understand it in there. I don't, the verse there is just saying, you know, he gave uh, knowledge to the rooster. Levi ikla lahu atra. We're going to continue now in all sorts of word issues. This is a kind of funny story. He gets to a place, Atagavar Kameh. I don't know if you'd say it's funny, but it's interesting, and the comments on the story are more interesting. A guy appears in front of him, okay, he gets into a city, a guy comes in front of him, Armale says to him, Kiva'an ploni. So and so did something to me. Kiva'an. Lova yada, my Kamale. He had no idea what the person was talking about. No clue. So Atashal Be Midrasha, what does he do? Okay, again, you don't know a word, what do you do? So he goes into the Beit Midrash. I guess it was his his, you know, safe place. He doesn't know he's new in town, right? So he goes to the Beit Midrash. Amarle Gazlan. They say to him, Oh, it means someone robbed me. Amarlach, Dirtiv. And they said, It says in the Pasuk, Hayikba Adam Elohim Vigomer. Okay, here's a reference in the Pasuk. Will a man be, be able to rob God? Like that can't possibly be. 
And that, there you see, yikaba means to rob. So, okay, he has this story. He sees this guy. He says something to him on the street. He doesn't know what the heck the guy is talking about. He goes to the bit of trash. He finds out what it means. But here we have like, a comment from the, you know, from the side. Amalei Rava mi Barnish le Rav Ashi. Rava from Barnish says to Rav Ashi, okay, this is later generation. Levi was early. This is much later in the, you know, at the end of the Amoritic time period. He says, hatam. If I was there, okay, this is right, hindsight. If I was there, Hava mina le hechi kvaach, b'mai kvaach, v'amai kvaach. I would have said to him, right? Someone says to me, someone kavauti. Okay, so what would I do? If you don't know what it means, I'd say, how did they do it? Where did they do it? You know, what, sorry, in what way did they do it? And why did they do it? Right? And then the person will start telling you the whole story. And then you'll figure out from the context what on earth that word means. So use the word in your question to kind of question them and say, you know, hechi kavach, ech kavach, b'mai kavach, with what? Amai kavach. He'd say, oh, I was walking on the street, he took a stick, he beat me, he grabbed my wallet, and, you know, then you'd know that he stole money from you. And then I would have known. So now they want to try to justify, you know, Levi should have thought about this. Why didn't he, why didn't he do that? So very likely he just didn't think about it. But the Gemara tries to defend him in an interesting manner, and they say, the Iu Saval milta di isura ka he said to himself, maybe kava'an is something having to do with inappropriate sexual relations. And he just doesn't really want to hear, he doesn't want to start asking him all the details because it's inappropriate. Which, by the way, is a whole interesting thing in and of itself. Right? If, if someone comes and starts telling someone, you know, something happened and, and he's asking for judgment or for, for advice, you know, is it okay to ask all the details or not if they're inappropriate details? You know, but I would think it would be okay. But maybe the Gemara is trying to say maybe he was uncomfortable with it and didn't want to start asking all sorts of questions because he thought it would be, you know, the information would be inappropriate. And maybe he thought, you know, I'm not anyway. Remember, Levi just showed up in this town. Maybe he felt like I'm not the one who should be dealing with this. It should be the locals. And maybe that's why, again, this is all the Gemara putting words into Levi's mouth. It's not necessarily that Levi said this or thought this to himself, right? We have no idea what Levi thought. We're talking generations later, and people are just trying to comment on the story. Like I said, it's very likely he just didn't think about that. And almost like, what are you getting from this? Well, they're almost giving you some good advice. If somebody starts talking to you and you don't understand what they're saying, just make them talk more. And the more they talk about it, the more you'll understand what they, what they mean. More words that the rabbis didn't know, and now finally we get to some words that if you know Hebrew, you'll know some of these words, actually. And it's funny, right? Words that to us are obvious. Right? Often, they don't know words, we don't know them, and we don't even understand their definitions of them. But here, we have the opposite, where we know what the word is, but they didn't know what it was. So, lo avayade rabana mai sehugim. They didn't know what sehugim meant. Shamua la amte de beirebi. Okay, you might remember her. She comes up a lot, which is um, the the maidservant of Rebbe. Seems to be of Rabbi Yudan Nasi. Remember, he was in a C. Uh, you know, he probably had a lot of maidservants, but this one seemed to be the main one. She was very knowledgeable, particularly when it came to language. And you see her across the Gemara, always speaking about words. There's also a very interesting story about her when Rebbe died, or was almost dying. Um, we'll get to that later in Shas. But anyway, remember her because she comes up a lot. So they heard her speaking. The rabbis were coming in to eat you know, slowly, slowly, bits and pieces, right? A few rabbis came, then another few, then another few. Amra lehu, she said to them, Ad matay atem nechnesim, serugin, serugin. Right, why are you always coming in in bits and pieces like this? So then they understood, that's what serugin means. Lo aviyadu rabbana, my chalag logot. Okay, this is something we don't exactly know what it means. It's going to, the translation is purslane, type of um, vegetation. Yom achad shamu la'amte de berebi, it's a vegetable. They saw the Amav of Rebbe, the Chazi Lahu Gavar, the Kamavadir Parpachine. She saw someone separating out this vegetable called a Parpachine. Amrale, Abmatai Tamafazir Chalaglogecha. Why you keep being, you know, separating your Chalaglagot? So then they understood that Chalaglagot or Parpachine, which again, that word doesn't really help us. The English translation maybe helps us, although I'm not really sure what Purslane is myself, so it doesn't help me very much. Maybe others of you do know. Okay, this is a pasuk in Mishle. She says, To romemecha is to make it higher, right? Like, um, Give it respect because you will hug it. Okay, most people understand this is a reference to the Torah. 
So, Yom Achada, Shamu Ola Amte Debe Rebbe, David Amre, La Ugavar, again, they saw the maidservant in the house of Rebbe. She was saying, Dava Kama Hapech Besa'are. Okay, she was, he was um, twisting his curls. Amrale, she said to him, You see, this woman was a tough woman, right? She starts criticizing the rabbis, why are you coming in piece by piece? She says to this guy, why are you keep twirling your curls, right? You can imagine right, all those people who curl their payas, you know, can see. It's like, well, what are you doing that for? So, but then they knew, ah, Miss Salsel is to turn it around and around. So what it means is turn around the Torah up and down, right? Almost like that, right? Turn it around and, and, and make it hot, you know, um, Raise it up. That's that's a that's a great thing. So now, um, next word. Lo hava yedei rabana my vitatatea b'matate hashmed. Okay, you will be. I'll already translate it in English. You will be swept up with a broom of destruction. This is a pasuk in Yeshayahu. It's actually a pretty famous pasuk. Yom echad shamu ala amte de berevi. Now they didn't know what a broom is, right? In he, modern Hebrew, it's a matate. Everybody knows that, but. Um, but now, so they didn't know what it was. They heard the Amma, Amta Debe Rebi, David Amre Lechaverta. She said to her friend, This is something you would more likely hear a maid serpent saying, other than the other things. Shkole Tetatia Vetate Beta. Pick up the broom and go sweep the house. Okay, that's more what you would expect her to be ordering people around about. And then they realized it means a broom. Throw upon God your Yahavcha, which we don't know what that means, and he will support you. Okay, we're finished with the Amma of, Reb, of Rebbe, and now we get to, he saw an Arab merchant, which is another way that, by the way, whenever they look for words, it's usually the Amma, it's either they went to a different country, they were near the water, or they saw an Arab merchant. He often brings a lot of um, knowledge about languages, because again, their language comes from the same language as ours. Have a darina tuna. I was carrying a big heavy load. Farmali shkol yavchai said to me, "Take your your load." Ve, sorry. <coughs> Vishade agamlai and put it on my camel. And my camel will carry it for you. So here, what do you see? Yavcha is your load. So now let's go back to the pasuk. Hashleich al Hashem yavcha. Put your heavy load on God, and He will support you. Okay. So now, what is the idea of all these? of all these um, these stories. So one option, first of all, it's interesting, the last one is very much connected to Rosh Hashanah. It's this idea of, you know, putting your, your burdens on God, that God will kind of help you and pick you out of this. So that's first of all, almost like maybe it was all a lead into this. Another way of looking at it is to say that what do you, the idea, if we go back to the beginning of the Masechah, and we talked a lot about the universal theme of Rosh Hashanah and how it's this idea about God being creator of the world. And this is very interesting because all the places where they found answers were all not from Jewish people, right? They were all not from people in Israel, not from Jewish people. They were all from people from all over. And maybe it's trying to talk about this universal theme and how we're all beings of God. We're all created by God and there's something to be learned from everybody. So it's possible that that's the idea here. Okay, with that, we're going to move to the next Mishnah. Now, the next Mishnah is very interesting because the next Mishnah is a debate. We started with the first Mishnah that said, Shofar, right? The Shofar, is it kasher or is it not? It's clear talking about halacha, right? Is this good? Is it not good? Can you use the Shofar of a para or not? Now we're going to start talking about what's the ideal Shofar to be using. And there's a debate. The Rambam understands this Mishnah as a continuation of the previous one. And it's talking straight halacha, meaning if it's not this, it's no good. Others understand, which is Tosfot and some others, that this is like a, that was what's good or not good. The next Mishnah is what, what is better, ideal, but not necessarily what we call, we have this a lot in other Masechto, Me'akev. It doesn't, if you don't do it this way, it's okay. You could still fulfill the mitzvah. So there's, it's a very important debate whether this Mishnah is set in stone, you know, and this is the way it is. It has to be this way or not, right? Or this is just the ideal. So that's very important to understand. Okay, the Mishnah starts up. Shofar shal Rosh Hashanah shal Ya'el Pashut. We'll pull up the pictures now. So we have a Ya'el Pashut. Okay, there's a big debate among the commentaries what a Ya'el is. Most, right, in modern, we know that Ya'el is an Ibex and the, and the Koran and the Steinsaltz, which was usually much more, you know, up on the animal definitions, 
says it's clearly an ibex, but just know that other commentaries, there was a big debate throughout the ages about what exactly a yael is. So shofar shel of an of an yael pashut. Now pashut means it's straight. You see this? It's a straight, right? It's obviously a little bit curved, but it's mostly straight. Not like our shofar, which is bent. Upiv, right? We obviously don't hold like Tanakama. Upiv mitzupezahav, and the the tip of it is covered in gold. We're going to have to discuss this in tomorrow's daf. In the temple, they didn't only blow the shofar, they also blew chatzot the trumpets. Shofar ma'arich, chatzot mekatzot. The shofar would be a long sound, and the chatzot would be shorter, because shemitzvah ayam b'shofar, because the main mitzvah of the day is the shofar. Uvitaniyot, okay, so, and, ah, and the shte chatzot minatzadim, I forgot to explain that. That means the shofar blower would stand in the middle, and the two people blowing the trumpets on his side, because the middle is always, right, when you look at something, you always look at the center. So that's the main, that's the main show. But, Ta'aniyot, and here's our lead-in to our next Masechet. We're going to compare the, the, the ceremonial nature of the Ta'aniyot. Ta'aniyot is all about Ta'aniyot when there's no rain. And when we call out to God, there's no rain. So, Ta'aniyot, you also blow the shofar and you also blow Chatzot But it's a different kind of shofar. B'shel Zcharim Kfufim, it's bent ram horns. U'piyam Etzupek Kesef, and it's covered with silver, not gold. U'shte Chatzot Zchot Ba'emtza. The Chatzot Zchot are more central. There's a big debate here. Whether Chatzotzot, the Ramam says the Chatzotzot on Etaniot Sibor or Mida Oraita, they're by Torah law. Because it says in the Torah, Alatzar Tzorer Etchem. Okay, here's the, the, the chauffeur of the Kafuf. Alatzar um, Tzorer Etchem, when an enemy comes upon you and you know, makes you suffer, come, comes the Rambam and he says it's the same thing for Etani. We have no rain, we're suffering, we have to blow the Chatzotzot. He views that as Do Oraita. Others view it as Jeroban, and Rashi says it's just to gather the people because we want everyone to gather together. And then most people understand that Rashi doesn't think it's actually from Torah law. Maybe you could possibly explain, because also by Torah law it says when you want to gather the people, you blow on the Chatzot's throat. But most people don't think that he means it's Torah law, and, and the Balaam or says explicitly it's rabbinic. There's a big machloket about it. But in any case, it's clear that Shofar Mekatser V'chatzot's throat Marichot, the Chatzot's throat are in the middle, and the chatzot shorter are much longer, and the shofar blasts are shorter. Shem mitzvah yom b'chatzot shot, because the main mitzvah is in the chatzot shot. Um, next, shave yovel rosh shana litzkiya uli brachot. Yovel is like rosh shana, and Rashi says it's from a zera shava of shvi'i shvi'i. It's all in the chodesh shvi'i. We learn from there that um, yovel is just like rosh shana according to Tanakama, both for the tzkiya, meaning which shofar you use, which for him would be the ibex, and also, Librachot, which most people understand, he means that Machli Yotzechronot and Shofarot, you say in Yom Kippur davening on the Yovel year. Very interesting. Some people have an issue with that. What do you mean? Those are themes for Hashanah, not Yovel. Yovel is all about freeing the slaves, not exactly the same thing. A little bit of a debate about that, but what that means, we'll leave it at that for right now. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Berosh Hashanah tokim b'shel zcharim u'biyovlot b'shem ya'alim. He disagrees with him, not about the Taniyot. He disagrees, number one, about the Rosh Hashanah. You use the ram, he says, not the ibex. And it should be bent. And Yovel, it's not the same. He doesn't have this Xerah Shava that he had, right? The Xerah Shavas were always passed down by Mesorah, by tradition. He didn't have a tradition about that. And therefore, he didn't think that Yovel was like, you do the other one, you use the Ibex for Yovel. So I'm a Rabbi Levi. Now, we don't actually hold by anyone in this bright Mishnah, and that's because of Rabbi Levi. We hold by Rabbi Levi. Mitzvah shel Rosh Hashanah vishel Yom HaKippurim Bikfufin. We use the bent one, both in Rosh Hashanah and Yovel. It's partly like Rabbi Yehuda, but not exactly. And that's what the Gemara is going to say right now. So then they say, But what about Tanakama? Why is he leave that? So they say, He says like the Tana here in this Braita, Which is really a quote from our Mishnah. Maybe it's just a mistake that it says, It's really from our Mishnah. So then they say, So why doesn't he just say the Halach is like Rabbi Yehuda? So they say, then we would have thought he also like Rabbi Yehuda across the board. Also about the Yovel, that Yovel is the same as Rosh Hashanah. It's not the same as Rosh Hashanah. But since he doesn't, right, Kam Ashmalan. That's why he tells us exactly what his halacha is. So you understand, he holds like Rabbi Yehuda about which one you need in Rosh Hashanah needs to be bent. But he thinks like Tanakama that Yovel and Rosh Hashanah have the same halacha. Again, Yovel we mean Yom Kippur in the Yovel year, in the Jubilee year, the 50th year. What's the root of the machloket here? 
Rabbi Yehuda says, the more you bow yourself down, right? That means basically you're surrendering to God and saying, I'm nothing, I'm a nobody. That's the most important. So the shofar reflects that. Again, we're getting to what's this issue of shofar? What is shofar doing? Okay, we're going to get hints all throughout these next sugyot about what's the idea of shofar. Bend yourself down, make yourself low. I'm nothing. So you might have, right? That's what he says. But Yom Kippurim, but on Yom Kippur, the Yovel year, Rabbi Yehuda thought to distinguish because he says, Kama de Pashit Inish Tfei you're straight, meaning like everything's equal in the Yovel year, right? Everybody goes free. That's more like a straight sound. We're all the same. Umar Savar, the other opinion, Tanakama says, Berosh Hashanah, now we have to distinguish between Rosh Hashanah and Taniyot, because the Tanakama distinguished between the shofar used for each. Berosh Hashanah, he wants the Yael. Kama de Pashit Inish Da'ate Tfei Ma'ale. In Rosh Hashanah, we want to be going the straight path. We're kind of looking forward. We're going in a straight path. Go for a straight shofar. Ube Taniyot, but on fast days. Where we're basically, we're in a time of stress. And we want to say to God, we're sorry. We want to do tshuva. We want to bow ourselves down and say, we're nothing. God, please help us. So it's interesting because that's the theme of Rosh Hashanah. But according to him, no, the theme of Rosh Hashanah is more straight. You want to straighten things out. You want to kind of put things in a straight path. Whereas Taniyot is almost like looking back and saying, you know, look where we were. We're nothing. Please let us get out of this, this difficult situation. Okay, with that, all that interesting information of today's stuff, we'll finish for today. Have a great day, everyone. Recording.